Good afternoon, everybody. I'm told we're ready to go. So let's kick off the final session of today. My name is Felina. I'm a system professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And I'm going to talk today about how code sounds, which may be something you've never really thought about. It wasn't something I thought about until very recently. So I want to take you through my adventure into why I've been exploring the sound of code. But first, to keep you awake, a little quiz. Who knows who said this? Everyone should learn how to program. I'm hearing Bill Gates, yeah? Someone else? Uh, other guesses? Elon Musk, yeah, could be. Uh, it's, it's both more or less correct. I think it's every programmer ever. We all love programming, right? And I'm sure a lot of you have also said to your own children or children you know or your neighbors or whoever, like, oh, programming is so amazing and everyone should learn it because I like it. So it is amazing for you as well. And this already immediately leads to an interesting question because if I say everyone should know programming, that means I have a vision in my mind of what programming is. But then isn't necessarily the same as when you say everyone should learn programming. If you ask people for definitions of programming, these definitions might differ from one person to another. So this statement in itself is interesting because, because what is programming? And I think it's best summarized by this story. Maybe you've heard this story, this parable before of three fish that are swimming in the sea. And the big fish says, hey folks, how's the water? And the two little fishies answer, What's water? We programmers, we are like the tiny fish. Maybe we aren't the best people to judge what programming is because we are swimming in the water of programming all the time. The only thing we know is programming. Many people that are in programming, their friends are also programmers, our whole social circle is in the world of programming. So are we really the best people to judge what programming is? So this, the next part of my talk is the story of me being sort of yanked out of the programming water, realizing, whoa, different people have different views on programming and people inside the programming space maybe aren't the best people to talk about programming. So let's go back to the year 2008 when I was just graduating university. I had a degree in theoretical computer science, so I knew everything about algorithms and big O notation and formal methods and stuff like that. I got my degree from Eindhoven where Dijkstra is from, so this is the education I had. I know, knew lots about programming, but not really a lot about the real world. And I moved to Delft, which is on the other side of the Netherlands. And of course, th this is a tiny country, but if you're from a tiny country, a 100 kilometer move is, is really a big move. So I entered a new world in Delft. This is the University of Delft where I'm working. And I started a PhD program. And the research question for my PhD program was to create a DSL, a domain specific language for finance. That was a proposal I was supposed to work on. And me and my supervisor had something like this in mind, a programming language that was expressive enough for people in finance to express things about finance. Like if the interest rate is high, you should sell stuff or something like that. But it was easy enough for people that weren't programmers to write some tiny programs in. This is more or less what we had in mind. And the first thing I did is I did an internship in an insurance company, AKA the real world that I hadn't really seen before. So my mental model of the world was more or less this. this what, I'm not sure if they still teach this in universities, but this is what they told me university is you have users. They are a type of people. Then there is a big wall. And then there are programmers, entirely different people, totally different kind of people, and sometimes they communicate a tiny bit. And the programmers program, and the users use. Turns out, what they told me in university was not entirely true. In this internship, I found out pretty soon that not only the users, not only the programmers were programming, but also the users were programming. The normal people, the people that were supposed to need our programming help, they were programming, all of them. But they weren't doing this. They weren't using traditional textual programming languages. They were using spreadsheets. 
they were using spreadsheets. The normal people, the people that had no knowledge of programming, they were just making risk models and all sorts of investment calculations in spreadsheets. They didn't need programmers to do that. They could do it by themselves. So I went back to my supervisor. I said, friends, they don't need a domain-specific language in finance. They have a domain-specific language in finance, and it's Excel. <laughs> and that became the topic of my PhD dissertation. It became the motto of my work, spreadsheets are code. I, I really say this without any irony. Spreadsheets are the best programming language that has ever existed in the history of programming. I'm, I'm not kidding. Spreadsheets are such a good programming language that you can accidentally program in them. Like, imagine doing Java by accident. <laughs> you, you open your laptop. Oh, I just installed Eclipse because it's super easy and intuitive. And then I opened Eclipse, which was also really easy, and I immediately knew what to do. Said no one ever. But this works for spreadsheets. You just open them, and, and it works, and you can start typing. And they aren't just code. They have all the buzzwords. Spreadsheets are functional programming. Think about it. A cell in a spreadsheet is guaranteed to be side effect free. What a formula can do is only to take input from other formulas and calculate a result based on that. It's purely functional. And they're also reactive. Spreadsheets are programmed in such a way that once you change a formula, only the part of the spreadsheet that needs to be changed is changed, and not everything. This is pure reactive functional programming. And yet, 750 million people can use spreadsheets. Eat that, Haskell. So this became the motto of my PhD dissertation. Spreadsheets are code, and I wrote a bunch of papers, and then ultimately I got my PhD. Hooray! This is, this is a true story. This is actually how it happened. I did my research on spreadsheets and, and I got a PhD for it. But this is the story of the brain, so to say. It are events that happened, but it wasn't the only thing that was happening with me. Because there's also the story of the heart. And the story of the heart of this part of my life isn't necessarily a super happy story. When I did this talk before, someone in the audience said, Feline is doing therapy session with an audience which is very much true. This is a part of my life that just wasn't very happy because of my work. Because what I did is I went to conferences just like this. I went there because I, I love giving talks. So I submitted talks all around the world and I went to some of them. So I said, hello, developer people. I have something to tell you. Spreadsheets are code. Super happy for Lina. But then you know what people said? It's not real programming. And you're, you're, you're laughing, and I, I'm laughing now, but it, it really wasn't all that much fun because your work is part of your identity. And especially if you're doing a PhD, if you're, if you're writing a dissertation, you and your topic are like one thing. So if people say it's not real programming, it, it really hurt me. Like, like why, why isn't it real programming? What even is real programming? So I tried the thing I pulled on you just, uh, just a minute ago. But, but, but listen, listen, listen. They're functional programming and they're reactive programming. But people be like, yeah, it's not real programming. And after a while, it really, it really drags you down. I really didn't want to work on spreadsheets anymore because apparently it wasn't real programming. And, and it's really very... It, it just sucks if you love your work and people say it's not real. And this is definitely that water of programming that I was talking about in the beginning. Maybe us programmers aren't the best people to judge what real programming is. Because why isn't something that definitely is a programming language not a real one? And at this point, I really thought that this is how professionals in a professional community interact with each other. You just say, oh, your work is shit, your programming language stinks, everything about you do is stupid, my club is way better. I thought this is the way people behave, all the people. And it was only way later, like in 2015, that I figured out there are also communities of adults that aren't shit to each other. It's weird, but they actually exist. So in addition to programming, I also like running. 
And people in the running community are so nice to each other. You just won't believe it. I have a friend, he's twice as quick as I am, but he never says that I'm not a real runner. We just go to competitions together and we share our training schedules. Everyone you tell you're a runner, if they're also a runner, they will only ask you like, oh, what is your next race? They will never say, oh, you have Adidas shoes. They have security vulnerabilities. You cannot use them anymore. People aren't like that. They're actively trying to change everyone into a runner. Like if I see you running to catch a bus, I'd be like, oh, do you like running? Do you want to run a game together? What's your personal record? Oh, I love running. Let's be runners. Let's be friends. Everyone is like that. And it's so amazing. And it's not just running that is so super inclusive. It's also knitting. So I love knitting and I had done lots and lots of knitting when I was a teenager. And then when I went to university, I just, yeah, I just didn't really have time. So I didn't knit for a while. And then in my early 30s, I came back to knitting. So I went to a knitting meetup with my, what turned out to be very old fashioned straight needles. Because believe it or not, knitting has moved on in the past two decades. And now no one uses straight needles anymore. People use circular needles. So imagine my angst coming into this meetup where everyone has the circular needles and I have the old fashioned, literally gotten for my grandmother straight needles. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be not real knitting again. They're going to be so mean to me. But it didn't happen. They were super nice. It was like, oh, we also made a transition from the straight needles to the circular needles and here's how you do it. And no one was mean. So seriously, programming, what are we doing to each other? Why, why, why? Because it doesn't have to be this terrible. Anyway, this was 2016, but I only realized later, as I said, that not all communities are that terrible. So if you go back to, blah, 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 go back to 2012, I was still super lost. I just got a job at the university where I did my PhD as well, where in my job interview, I said, oh, I love spreadsheets. And the next five years before you give me tenure, I'm going to do more of my cool spreadsheet work. But I wasn't really feeling it, but I had promised research. So I was really, I was really down and I, I didn't know what to do. It's like, yeah, I should work on spreadsheets. I don't really feel like it. I wasn't so aware why I didn't feel like it. So yeah, it wasn't a great time. My luck was that through networking and through people I knew in my neighborhood, I heard about a group of kids in the community center that needed a programming teacher on Saturdays. So I was like, yeah, I could do this. At least I'll do something useful for the world if in addition to five days of not working spreadsheets at the university, at least on the sixth day, I hang out with some kids that want to learn programming. And then an interesting thing happened to me because when I started to teach this, these kids programming, I remembered how I learned programming when I was a kid. So this is me, age 10. How did I learn programming? There was no internet. It existed, but not where I was from. We didn't have any internet. So I had a book from the library, a book with basic listings that I just copied into the computer for hours and hours and hours. And this is how I taught myself basic. And I think this is what many people of my generation experienced when they were learning programming. They were by themselves or with a group of peers trying to teach themselves programming. So notably absent in this picture is a teacher. And again, it's not just me, lots of people from my of my generation don't have an active memory of a programming lesson. As a community, we don't really know how programming education looks like because many of us haven't gone to programming education or have only gone to programming education as adults and not when they were younger kids. So here again, the water of programming situation arises because we have all lacked the experience of teaching programming because we have never received programming education. We have a weird sense of how education should be because imagine you're caring for a child and they want to play the guitar or they want to learn tennis. What do you do? Do you say, hey friend, here's a banjo. Here's a tennis racket. 
go for it. No, of course not. The first thing you would do if your kid is really excited about something is you, you get them a tutor or you bring them to a club. If it's a sport like soccer, maybe they go to a club. But you would always say, yeah, here, you, you can have guitar lessons or you can have tennis lessons. Lessons is not such a weird thing to think of if you want to teach someone something. But yet in programming, programming lessons isn't really a thing. And you could think this is due to the history of our field. Programming is still relatively new. So, of course, we didn't have lessons because they didn't exist. But it's actually only partly true. Because if you look at the history and philosophy of programming, and especially the history and philosophy of programming education, it's sort of deliberate that it ended up the way that it ended up. Because who knows who this is? The guy that created Logo. So this is Seymour Papert, he's a South African mathematician actually, and he created the programming language Logo that many people used to learn programming when they were young, maybe even before there was basic, people already used Logo to do programming for kids. And he was a mathematician, but he studied actually with a very, very famous psychologist, one of the most famous psychologists of the last century called Jean Piaget. He was a French psychologist, and he's very known as the founder of constructivism. And it goes beyond the scope of this talk to really talk about everything that constructivism is. But the basic idea of constructivism is that it is impossible to teach someone something. The only thing that someone can do is construct their own version of reality. And of course, a teacher can help in constructing reality, but it is really impossible to export knowledge to someone else's brain. You have to support people in constructing, finding, exploring their own reality. And Piaget has said about Papert, the creator of Logo, that no one understands my work better than Seymour Papert. So Logo wasn't born out of nothing. It was born out of the tradition that people believe that it was better for people, for learners, for kids, to create their own version of re reality rather than to explain them how reality was according to more expert people. And if you know about this, then it makes more sense that the first programming languages for kids were actual programming languages. It makes sense that someone was like Seymour Papert would create a language, whereas someone coming more from the philosophy of let's teach kids things, let's get them a tutor, could have created something like an interactive tutor with more explanation. Even in the time of Logo, it wouldn't have been impossible to create a text-based lesson in which kids would get explanation and practice and only then were left to a free form of programming. And this wasn't created to, for various reasons, but also for the philosophical reasons of the group of people that worked on early programming education. And this leads to the fact that how many people teach, at least this is how I was teaching those kids in the Saturday club, I taught them about the hard stuff. I said, okay, here are concepts to talk about because those were the things that I would struggle with when I was younger, that the higher level things. What I definitely didn't talk about was things like syntax. Like, it really, really, really matters where the colon goes. This is the stuff, you know, they figure it out. If you just read three books of Python listings, I'm sure you would see by yourself, you would construct your own version of reality in which you would also conclude that it really, really, really matters where the colon goes. Sadly, that didn't really happen. So the kids in my club were struggling way more than I thought they needed to struggle. Just having been exposed to some programming didn't didn't bring them understanding of syntax. It didn't bring them understanding of concepts. Many would make similar mistakes time and time and time again. So this really got me thinking, hmm, why? Why is this so hard? Why is it? I, I just didn't understand that something that came with great ease to me when I was 10 didn't came, come with great ease to the kill children in my club. This is when I met this amazing person, Andreas Stepik. He's a university professor at the University of Nevada, and he did an amazing experiment. 
If you ever think that you know, computer science is boring and it's only about formal methods, let me blow your mind because he did one of the funniest experiments in computer science. What he did was he took 100 students and he gave them programming exercises, the same exercises in a bunch of different languages. So some of the languages were Java, Perl, Python, and Ruby. So far, nothing weird. He also included e exercises in Quorum, which is a language that he designed himself, and also programming exercises in a final language, Randomo, which is what you think it is. <laughs> it is a language with randomly generated keywords. Just like, let's throw in something weird in the mix to see what happens. So. The next thing that happens might shock you. Here's the performance of the experiment in decreasing order. So Randomo didn't really do great. But it didn't do better than Java and Perl. <laughs> and Quorum, Python and Ruby did better. This is amazing, right? I'll put it on a slide for you. This is totally tweet bait. You can take a picture of this and put it on the internet because it's actually quite funny. Novice programmers don't do better in Java or Perl than a randomly generated language. This is how bad we are at making programming languages. Kids, novice learners, are really aren't supported by the syntax. It isn't like, oh, you just read it and of course it makes sense. And if you think about it, it's actually not that weird. There are so many weird things in programming syntax that we don't even think about anymore. Something like a loop that starts with four. Four I in range something something. Why is it four? Four is also the number four. Some kids are immediately confused because they see four, they don't really understand a lot, they see four, they think, oh, this is repeated four times. Sort of, sort of makes sense, but it doesn't. So syntax really, really isn't intuitive. It isn't as simple as we think it is. You should definitely teach it and practice it with novice learners because it isn't something you magically pick up through repeated exposure. So that gave me the what. I figured out what I needed to do. I needed to have a bigger focus on syntax. But then I didn't know how to do that yet. How would I make syntax learning useful and fun and effective? So then I met another amazing person. And this is not just an amazing person. This is an amazing person with an art degree. Alexandra West. And we were at a conference in Paris that was super awesome. And we had some drinks and we started to think about the big questions in life. Like, what if we view code as artworks? What if we do code reviews like reviews they do in art? And I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. But what if we create source code as art? We could have cubistic code and brutalist code and rococo code. What would it even mean if we would do that? This was a very nice, entertaining evening. But it didn't only lead to a hangover. It also led to a workshop that I did at the Booster Conference two years ago called Code as Art, Art as Code, where I wanted to explore the idea of how can we view source code to an artistic lens with participants. And people really, really liked the workshop. One of the people in the workshop said that it was the most fun he ever had with his clothes on. So that was amazing. People definitely had fun picking out random artworks and making algorithms based on art. But it wasn't a very effective workshop. I, I wasn't really happy about it. And I'll show you a bunch of slides from the workshop so you can get a sense of why I wasn't really happy about it. One of the things to warm people up to the idea of code as art is that I didn't want to start with visual paintings immediately because that's very removed from source code. I thought, let's start with poems first. They look like code a little bit more because they're also made with letters. And then we can move on to more abstract forms of art that are further away from source code. So these are actual slides from the workshop. I said, okay, let's make some poems with art. And one of the things you need to do in a poem is count the syllables because you need to get a poem on the right metrum for it to sound nice. So I said, here is some code, some Python, and you would say this has uh, six syllables and the next one has also six. 
upper, and then you have that symbol there. Oh, you can just pick is or becomes or equals. Whatever you want to call that symbol doesn't really matter to me. Just pick one, and then you can count the syllables. This didn't really work. The people in the workshop started to debate the sound, how you would pronounce that keyword, to no end. She said, oh yeah, sure, we'll take is. No, we won't. Is is ridiculous. Is is equality. That isn't assigning something. Okay, we do, let's just do stores. And <laughs> People were really engaged in discussing how to pronounce the equal sign. It was super surprising to me. I didn't think that was going to be the key takeaway of the workshop. I thought we were going to create poems and artworks. But this is where people spend most time discussing how to pronounce the source code to even count the syllables to even make a poem. And it, it went on in very weird directions. For example, an open bracket. Some people even said that the open brackets should be pronounced in different ways, depending on whether you're defining a function or calling a function. They would say, well, if you're defining it, you should say f, and then the open bracket should call, be called takes. So f takes n, comma, 5, or something like that. But if you're calling it, it should be of, it should be f of x, or f of 5. So they would even vocalize the same symbol differently depending on the context. I really didn't see that one coming. It was so surprising that that was where most of the effort of the workshop went through, and not through cubistic quicksort. So I was like, wow, apparently we have no clue how to pronounce source code. And apparently it matters, at least in the context of making poems, but probably it also matters in the context of learning a programming language. And I set out to read something about how do kids even learn how to read? How do people reach a consistent way of pronouncing letters? And I was like, wow, we know nothing. When I've, I had concluded reading the Handbook of Reading, they know everything about reading. They, they, they already know, well, if kids are four months old, then they start to think about this type of words, and they do all sorts of involved experiments with two-year-olds and two-and-a-half-year-olds, how they build up language and how many words they hear. So many extensive research. And we in programming, we don't know anything on how people construct a reality of the source code that they're reading. And it's pretty interesting. If people learn to read, especially if kids learn to read, the first thing they do is they focus on letters. So if a really young kid, like a five-year-old, is reading, they would read like b -u -k, book. In the Netherlands, we even have uh, this hand gesture that we teach kids. So if kids are reading, they do b -u -k, book. It's really cool. Only after a while they can read full words. This takes some effort to automate reading letters to be able to read a word at once. And this isn't the final stage. This isn't the stage where adults like us are at because kids that are reading words at once still have lots of cognitive load, is what it's called, spend lots of energy on reading a word. So you could have a six and a half or a seven year old read a sentence like cat in tree and you ask them, okay, so where is the cat? They don't know because all of their energy has been spent on reading every single word that they didn't have memory left to also remember the words. It's really, really pretty interesting. And then only later, if you're eight or nine or 10 or up to adults, you see book and immediately you think of the object, the, the abstract thing that is a book. You can do that without spending any effort, but it isn't. This hasn't happened by magic. This is because you've practiced letters and then you've practiced words years and years and years and then you're able to automate this. And then is it just for kids that sounding out is, is part, a big part of reading? This still happens for adults. It still matters. So I'm a scientist. So let's do a scientific experiment with all of you. I know it's like six, so you're, you're super eager to go to the party. So I'll give you some brain and hands activity to help you be awake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you sentences like this. You read the sentence silently in your brain. And when you reach the end of the sentence, you raise your hand. Perfect. There is a catch, though. I'm not going to show the entire sentence as at once. I'll show you half the sentence, 
and then the rest of the sentence. And then you raise your hand if you're at the end of the second half. So we'll practice. One more practice. This is how it will go. Half a sentence. The other half. And if you're ready, you raise your hand. Perfect. Now for the real part, let's go. Next one. So statistically, I didn't measure you or anything, but statistically, this second sentence should have taken you longer than the first sentence. Because when you think of the word T-E-A-R, you can also think of tear and not just of there. And tear is actually even a bit more common. So what happened in your brain was you were sounding out the words and you said, I have a tear. And then once the second part appears, you're like, oh, it's a tear. And you have to go back, read it again, make the sounds in your brain, and then read the rest of the sentence. And this is one of the experiments which, which scientists have shown that people do subvocalization, which is a sciencey word for reading the words out loud in your brain. And they've even compared people's performance on these type of sentences with sentences where the meaning changes, but not the sound. For example, calf, it can mean part of your leg, but it can also mean a tiny cow. And you can have a sentence like, I hurt my calf in the shed or in the gym. And then it changes meaning, but not sound. And those sentences are still quicker than sentences in which nothing changes. So it's really not about the change in meaning. It is about the change in sound because people still subvocalize. You, you just you can't shut it off. It just happens. So this makes you confused because tear and t tear sound the same. Of course, this trickery is only possible in the English language. In my native Dutch, this would be entirely impossible because we pronounce stuff in systematic ways. The conclusion, though, apart from English is a shitty language, is sound matters. When words sound ambiguous, comprehension, or at least the time to comprehend, suffers. And this leads to, of course, the next research question, when keywords sound ambiguous, thus comprehension of source code also suffer. And we've already seen in this first experiment in the workshop that I was talking about that people don't really know how to sub-focalize keywords or operators. So how would it affect programming? We asked a bunch of novices. We asked 10 kids to pronounce Python. They already had half a year of Python experience, so they really did know some programming. And we asked them, what is this? Read it aloud. Imagine you're on the phone to your friend. You're reading them a Python program. What would you read? Well, the results greatly varied. All sorts of things. X is 5. X equals 5. It gets 5. Set X to 5. Assign 5 to X. A variety of answers. We did the same thing with 22 professionals, both Python programmers and also programmers of different programming language, and we more or less got the same chaos. There is no agreement on how to pronounce operators and keywords. In this second workshop with the 22 professionals, we even tried, we forced people to reach a consensus. We said, okay, these are the results of the whole group. Now debate, what do you think is the best? Can you reach a conclusion? It was virtually impossible to get people to agree on what was best. So lots of chaos and lots of opinions. Basically like everything of programming. These 10 novices, and this was interesting because this was a, an effect we didn't anticipate. These were Dutch children. So we asked Dutch kids to read the code and we found lots of extra confusion for non-native English speakers. For example, this letter here, how would you pronounce this letter in Polish? E, yes. It's the same how you would pronounce it in Dutch. This letter is the letter E. The English, of course, pronounce it as I, as in tie, whereas the Dutch people, like the Polish, say E as in creep. Interestingly enough, some kids mixed the pronunciation of E and I. Even within the same code snippet, we saw some kids saying for I in range of something something, print E. In the same code snippet. And, and there, of course, you wonder, Wow, do they really fully comprehend? Have they automated that this is in fact the same variable? 
And we observed teachers as well. And teachers were very, very inconsistent in speaking. Usually when they say something like for in range, they say for I in range. They do it in the English way because range sounds English and it's sort of like an idiom. But then if they're walking around and kids ask a question like, hey, teach, what variable should this be? They're communicating in Dutch. So then the teacher says, oh, that's the variable E. Greatly confusing kids, even in these tiny programming programs where the variables, they're right next to each other, the same variable. But if they don't sound the same in your brain, do you really fully get there the same? So the conclusion from this is probably we should tell kids. Probably we should tell kids how to vocalize code, which isn't really weird. In mathematics, all the symbols have words as well. And this is something that the teacher talks about. This is how you say this is a plus or an add or something like that. It depends a bit on what book you use, but at least within a lesson or in a book, it's consistent. And what we did in a subsequent experiment with different kids is we had kids say code aloud in the classroom, which really sounds weird for programming education, but again, for mathematics education, if you do the tables of multiplication, for example, we do one times five is five, two times five is 10. This is how we practice something. And we did the same with source code. We said, this is how you say it for I in range, open bracket for closing brackets, colon. And the whole room said for I in range as a group, very much what they're used to. The kids didn't think it was weird at all. It was just like lots of other lessons. And the result was, unsurprisingly, because otherwise probably I wouldn't be sharing it with you, is that practicing this helped. The group of kids that read source code every week performed better than the other group on syntax questions, which, again, speaking from mathematics education or language education, is really not that surprising, but is definitely not a way of teaching that we have internalized. So the conclusion from these results and my message to all of programming is, apart from spreadsheets or code, still counts. Also, let's agree on a way to pronounce code. Let's agree on what we call a code phonology. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the same for any programming language. We have different coding styles as well for Python versus C. But at least within a programming language, let's get our acts together and figure out, okay, X is five, we pronounce it as X gets five. And if X is, is 12, we say if e X equals 12. It doesn't really even matter to me what we pick, but it will definitely be super beneficial to education if we can rely on the fact that if I say X gets five, I know all of the kids in the classroom are exposed to the same programming concept or syntax in their brains. And I can also test this. I can test kids at a very low level. I can just say, write down X gets five. And if they cannot do that, I know they're still in a very, very low level of programming understanding. Just like if kids are struggling with how to read book, I could ask a kid, write down the B or point at the letter B. And then I can lower, I can zoom in to their confusion. So this is then adding a level of confidence for the teacher that at least they know what programming concept I'm referring to. But it isn't just for education that I think such a code phonology might make total sense. People that are doing pair programming, especially remote pair programming, and especially if they're polyglot and work in many different code bases with many different programming languages, can get super confused. Like I've done pair programming coming from C, going to Python, I was confused about symbols all the time. So I, someone would say, okay, now type a bracket. But if you're coming from a C-like language, the first thing you think of bracket is that thing, the accolade, and not a round bracket. And then you have conversations. I'm sure lots of you have had these type of conversations in prayer programming. No, I meant the other bracket. Oops. No, I meant a round one. So if we have a clear vocalization of all the keywords and all the symbols that will also help pair programming and especially remote pair programming where it isn't so easy to point at things. And the third category of people that will be really, really helped with a code phonology are people with disabilities, especially people with visual disabilities. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you have, you should definitely try it because most operating systems and programs have a built-in screen reader. 
And if you're reading source code, probably you've not thought of this unless you're visually impaired yourself, they are not really made for, write, for reading source code. So if you have something like this, it would read this, dev underscore underscore init underscore underscore, open bracket, close brackets, colon, etc. Whereas you could also pronounce this as initialization method or constructor or something at the higher level of semantics and then you don't need to know all the characters and this isn't even the most terrible example it gets worse because if you have something like this if you have a class with a field it would read the screen reader would read harry and then a pause because a dot isn't spoken and then name yeah, you, you think it's funny. Well, if you lose your eyesight tomorrow, you will not think it's very funny. It's very frustrating. So the only way to address this, of course, those screen readers are cu customizable. You can fix this by forcing the thing to read everything. But that's also not what you want. But that is the only way to fix this issue of dots and also commas and often also semicolons aren't spoken because in natural language, you wouldn't speak them. And similarly, if we have a way of speaking source code, if people can use their arms and they would read source code to program in a vocal way, it would also be very easy if they could speak, for example, say, create a constructor method. And in Python, it would immediately do underscore underscore in it rather than you would have to say all the characters out loud. So also people with a variety of disabilities would really, really be supported if we would agree on a way code sounds both for input and for output. So that's more or less everything I wanted to share with you today because I know some people came in late and also it is late, so maybe you were sleeping. It's so dark, I would understand. I will summarize my talk in, let's say, one minute. So this is your second chance to get the entire gist of the talk. So if you have just woken up, you're in good luck. This is the two minutes. If you can pay attention now, you will have understood most of the talk. Firstly, the water of programming. We are all in the water of programming and that makes it really hard for us to judge what is and what isn't programming. And this sometimes leads to us saying that part of programming isn't real programming or it isn't hard, like front-end programming is easy or something for mobile isn't real hardcore computer science, but it's super stupid. So don't be these people. Don't be the not real programming people. It's really not making our field a better place. So don't be like this. If I hear you say it, I will find you and I will hunt you down. Don't be these people. Secondly, part of this water of programming is not only what we think programming is, but also what we think programming education is. Lots of us have taught ourselves programming, and as a field, we often say, ah, oh, people that taught themselves programming as a teenager, those are the real programmers, they were naturally drawn to it. But this isn't an accident. We actively, accidentally maybe shaped or feel in such a way that people that can learn by themselves feel more welcome that, than people that need explanation. But that's sort of weird because we don't expect kids to read by themselves. We don't expect kids to math by themselves or tennis or, or guitar. So we should pay more attention to explaining things to kids. For example, one of the things that we are focusing on in Delft right now is explaining to kids how to pronounce source code because we checked and they don't do it intuitively. And there are interesting natural language effects that we, we didn't really think that would make it even harder. But if you don't speak English as a first language, like many people in the world do, then keywords and variable names can be extra confusing because you're split between multiple pronunciations for some variables. In an experiment we did, we found that having kids actively say source code and repeat source code aloud makes them better at understanding or reproducing the syntax. So from all of this, we should conclude that programming, like math education also, definitely needs a phonology. We need to agree with each other. This is how you pronounce the keywords. This is how you pronounce the symbols. This is how you pronounce the operators because it will make the world a, a better place for a variety of people, kids, but also pair programmers and people with disabilities. The end 
If you've enjoyed listening to me, I'm on Twitter as well. This is my Twitter handle and this is my website where I blog about my own research, but also about a variety of computer science papers of conferences that I go to and other things that I think are really interesting. People ask me, I'm not going to do Q&A because it's late, but I will answer one question. Yes, I have drawn these slides by hand, but not with a real pencil, but with an Apple pencil and an app called GoodNotes on the iPad. If you've enjoyed listening to me, you might also enjoy listening to the podcast SE Radio because I'm one of the hosts where we interview people from so the software engineering field in a one hour interview format. So you might want to check that out as well. And thanks to awesome people. Have fun at the party. It's in room 12, I've been told. <laughs>